Excellent. So, so good morning, everyone. So uh, what I'm going to talk uh, today, it's uh, about the model Hamiltonians for theoelectrics, uh, anti-theoelectrics and uh, uh, multi-theorics there. And, and this has done by a lot of people uh, over the years, I would say over the last uh, 20 years, and has been supported by um, a lot of different agencies. So let me go with the outline first. I will talk about uh, quite briefly about pair of, pair of skies and the general ideas uh, between effective Hamiltonians. Then I will spend some time about uh, effective Hamiltonian approaches for a lot of different uh, systems in the sense uh, sample pearlectrics, uh, pearlectric solid solutions, nanostructures, but also what do you do when you have more than polarization and strain in your system, such as uh, tiltings or uh, magnetism? You can do that with effective Hamiltonian these uh, days. Uh, a brief uh, conclusions, but also a, a little bit of time on other developments uh, uh, in effective Hamiltonian techniques that we have been working on uh, for some years, uh, like uh, dynamical properties rather than static uh, properties. So about the uh, qubit perovskite, I think a, a lot uh, of you uh, know that uh, it's a simple uh, chemical formula, ABO3, AB cations, or the oxygen um, anions uh, in that uh, high symmetry uh, cubic structure, A at the corner of the cube, B at the center, and the oxygen uh, ions are at the middle of the uh, phases. Very simple uh, uh, structure, but quite a lot of uh, diversity uh, between uh, ABO3 perovskite. For example, biome titanate is a prototypical uh, pheoelectric. It's a sample systems. If you go to potassium tantalate, also perovskite, it's a very interesting system, known as uh, incipient pheoelectric or quantum pyroelectric. It means that uh, quantum effects, namely 0 0.4 phonon vibration, kill pheoelectricity. You can go to lead zirconate titanate, it becomes a little bit more complex because you have solute solutions. And also you have oxygen octahedral tilting, which is known as also as anti distortive AFD distortions that happen for some composition. And then you can go to nanostructures, films, wire, dots, super lattices that uh, even put higher uh, complexity, the complexity. And you have sodium naubet, for instance, then, or lead zirconate. This is now anti anti-ferroelectrics, not anymore ferroelectrics. You go to bismuth ferrite, it's a perovskite. It has ferroelectricity, it has tiltings of oxygen octahedra, and it has magnetism. It's a multiferric. So quite complex uh, system, a lot of different phase transition. For example, in sodium naubet, you have seven phases as you decrease temperature. You can have compositional disorder in alloys. You can have finite size effects in these nanostructures, and you can have coupling between different degrees of freedom, ferroelectric, strain, tiltings, anti-ferroelectric magnetisms, etc., in these uh, systems. So easy formula, quite not easy uh, physics. So as uh, Osvaldo uh, explained yesterday, most of the time, the polarizations come from one single phonon mode. It's a TO mode. It's called soft phonon mode. For example, in biome titanate, this is how it looks like. Titanium is moving up, biome a little bit up as well, and oxygen ion are moving down. So it's a collective motions of uh, ions. It's a, a gamma center uh, mode. And this creates the polarization in biome uh, titanate. And in fact, if you look at biome titanate, we say experimental data, very interesting phase diagram. As you cool the system, you go from cubic, where there is no polarization, then tetragonal, where you have a polarization along 0, 1, then orthorhombic, the polarization is now along 1, 1, 0, and then rhombohedral, where the polarization is along 1, 1, 1. And along this phase transition, the strain is changing, because the shape of a system is changing along with the direction of the polarization. And if you go to PZT, um, this is the temperature versus composition diagram. You go from lead zirconate on the left to lead titanate on the right. Beatrice Noheda and collaborators in 1999 found that in addition to rhombohedral state for lead zirconate rich system, and tetragonal state for titanium rich system, there is a tiny compositional area for which is neither rhombohedral nor tetragonal. It is a monoclinic phase. It was a nice discovery because PZT has been known for some time, but the monoclinic phase has been discovered um, 20 years ago. So the challenge is as follows. Is it possible 
to develop or use a theory that can treat such a complexity. Since uh, the 1990s, first principle method have been used in, in uh, perovskites and theoelectrics and have been really uh, very, very useful. In my mind, it's a huge revolution uh, to have used these uh, DFT calculations to understand this system. But most of the time, they are limited to with two big limitations. Most of the time, you stay at 0k, even if these days you can do a finite temperature effects in DFT. And a big problem in my mind is that you study small cells in the sense that 200, 300 atoms is already a big deal with DFT. But if you want to mimic complexity, especially for nanostructures or solid solutions, you really need to go to, I don't know, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million atoms. So an ideal computational scheme will be as follows. You keep the good things about first principle methods, the accuracy, but you get rid of these two shortcomings. So that's the uh, basic idea behind effective Hamiltonian. It was first developed by uh, Zong, uh, um, David Vanderbilt, and uh, Karen Rehm in, in the 1990s as well. So what uh, they suggested is to basically, you, you don't look at all the degrees of freedom, you keep the most important ones. And I'm going to show you which one are the most important ones. Once you have selected these guys, you develop an expression of the energy that depends on these degrees of freedom. And in this expression, you have expansion coefficients and you get these guys by doing a initial calculation. And if possible, you don't use uh, experimental uh, input. So everything is at a uh, initial level. When you have the degrees of freedom, the energy and the expansion coefficient, you put them into Monte Carlo techniques or Monte Carlo dynamics, and then you can get properties as a function of temperature. You can look at phase transition. You can look at a lot of physical responses, dielectric, piezoelectric, magnetoelectric, electrocaloric, uh, really uh, a huge amount of properties uh, can be computed with the Hamiltonian uh, these days. So what are the important degrees of freedom to understand that? A very nice uh, graph was done by Philippe Gauzet in his uh, thesis. And this is the phonon spectra of cubic biome detonate. And you see unstable branch. And this is this uh, uh, soft mode uh, branch. So you have to take into account soft mode. And you also need to take into account acoustic branches. Because as I showed you before, when you have electric phase transition, the strain is changing, and the strain is related to the acoustic branches. So that's what uh, effective Hamiltonian uh, were doing in the 1990s. They selected the uh, soft mode, which is related to polarization. And once again, it's a collective motion. This means for each five atom unit cell, you have one local mode, not five. You don't have something biome, titanium, oxygen. You have something that basically incorporates the collective motions of these uh, ions. And then you also select acoustic modes uh, for the strain. And in fact, uh, this is a nice uh, uh, representation. In each five atom unit cell, you have local modes and you have strain. So if, for instance, the local modes are parallel to each other in all the unit cells, you are talking about electricity. If they are anti-parallel to each other, you are talking about anti electricity And so how it is defined, uh, Professor Diggs really explained that very well yesterday. It's basically uh, this local mode is defined in terms of soft mode again vectors. You can use the dynamical matrix, but uh, most of the time we use the force constant matrix to get this, uh, to define these local modes there. And you got it from the high symmetry cubic structure. So, First, effective Hamiltonian were developed for simple electric system. This is a very famous uh, paper by Zong, uh, Vanderbilt, and uh, Karin Rehm. And there were five there, but depends on local mode and strain. Let me go uh, about uh, one by one. So you have the self energy. Uh, and the self energy is basically describing uh, the double well uh, potential. You have dipole-dipole interaction very important for electric, not so important for magnetic system. You have short range interaction between dipoles. You have elastic, pure elastic energy that tells you how much it costs the system to deform, elastically speaking. And you have interaction between soft mode, which means dipoles, and the strains. And what I indicated in red here are all the coefficients that you get 
by performing uh, first principle calculations. So this is a general, uh, these are general equations, but when you go from one system to another one, what changes are basically these red uh, coefficients. And you can get them from first principle. For instance, if I look at short range interaction, one of the five energy, you see they are quite different one. You have the one we call J1. It's interaction between two dipoles that are oriented on the Z axis, but that are distance along the X axis. You have J2, it's sort of interaction between two dipoles along Z axis, but the distance now is along the Z axis. And you have a quite complicated one as well, like a J5 and J7. It's between different components of the dipoles and different uh, nearest neighbors. J5 is second nearest neighbors, J7 is third nearest neighbor. So it's Ising like technique and you go to third nearest neighbors and it's highly anisotropic. It's quite different than magnetic uh, system. And then you get DFT calculations to get these parameters. For example, if I want to get the J parameters, I, I do this kind of simulation where the dipoles are uh, uh, differently oriented and you get this J1, J2, J3, J7 uh, parameters uh, to get them. Okay. When you have these parameters, as I told you before, you can use them into Monte Carlo simulation. You can use Metropolis algorithm. These days, we can also use wang landau uh, algorithms or a hybrid uh, Monte Carlo. Typically, you can use 12-12-12 uh, primitive cells, which means basically uh, six or 7,000 uh, atoms. But now, uh, thanks to techniques like hybrid Monte Carlo and uh, going GPU rather than CPU, we, we can do uh, 1 million uh, atoms uh, calculation. This was uh, developed by uh, Sergei Prokhorenko. You usually you use 100,000 Monte Carlo sweeps, but if you are dealing with very subtle things, like for example, magnetism, it's much better to use 1 million uh, Monte Carlo sweeps. And then you, when you get this uh, calculation as output, you do uh, statistical uh, averages. And, and for instance, you can, this is one idea, you can choose a supercell. On the left side, you do calculation when there is no electric field, epsilon equals zero, you get the ground state properties. You can also do calculations for which you put an electric field. In that case, you add a term to the alloy to do the effective Hamiltonian. It's minus P dot E product between uh, polarization and electric field. And then you get states that minimize uh, energy that depends on electric field. You compare these two kinds of calculation, you can get piezoelectric coefficient, you can get dielectric susceptibility. In fact, you can be much smarter than that. There is beauty in statistical mechanics that tells you that even if you do only a calculation for which there is no electric field, you can derive piezoelectric and dielectric properties uh, via uh, um, cumulant uh, approaches. So this is usually what we do. We usually get uh, physical responses by cumulant approaches using no field. And for example, this was the first result in these famous uh, papers of uh, Zong, Vanderbilt, and, and Ram. This was for uh, biome titanate. On the left side, this is local modes versus temperature. This means polarization. On the right side, it's the strain versus temperature. What you can you see? You reproduce the experimental phase transition sequence. You go from cubic, then tetragonal, for which polarization is along uh, 0 and 1, then autorhombic, and then rhombohedral for which now operations along 111. And along these changes in polarization direction, you see that the strain is changing uh, as well. So it was the first uh, um, application of this effective uh, Hamiltonian uh, in um, biome titanium, it was done. And it was very nice that you can reproduce uh, um, experimental phase transition sequence. Be careful, uh, you don't reproduce well uh, a phase transition sequence uh, most of the time. It depends on the system you are looking at. And, and then we decided with uh, Aliriza Akbarzadeh to, to, to do something else. Uh, for instance, we look at uh, potassium tantalate there. This is a very interesting system. It has a huge dielectric response at low temperature, but it's still cubic to zero Kelvin. And there are very strange things like first order Raman line, which is forbidden in cubic symmetry. So, so people have been debated what's going on inside this system and they say it's quantum effects. If there will be no zero point phonon vibration, it will be ferroelectric. There are zero point phonon vibration, they kill ferroelectricity. So this is what we wanted to check and we wanted to have a look how does this system look inside and for that, we use very, very nice techniques. Uh, um, this is Path Integral Monte Carlo. Uh, 
One of the paper that I tremendously enjoy is a paper from David Sipperle about this Parfantegra Monte Carlo uh, techniques. And uh, how does it work? Uh, the idea is, is very nice and simple. Imagine you have interaction between two particles on the quantum level, particle one and particle two. Quantum effects means that the particle one self interact with itself via classical ring uh, polymer. And um, this is denoted as a Trotter uh, number. So if it interacts five times with itself, it means your Trotter number is five. Same thing for particle two, it interacts itself. And then there are interaction between particle one and particle two at each imaginary time. And this interaction in our case are given by the effective Hamiltonian uh, technique. So what we did, we use this effective Hamiltonian approach for simple system. It was developed in 95, but we use it in two different kinds of Monte Carlo simulation. We use classical Monte Carlo um, metropolis algorithm. This means there are no quantum effects. And we use this path integral uh, Monte Carlo, which means quantum effects are on. And in both cases, we got local modes, we got strain, uh, we got dielectric response. So let me show you uh, the result. These are experimental data. This is how the dielectric response versus temperature looks like in potassium titanate, you see this huge value for 1,000 at low temperature. There is another experiment that shows the same thing there. And then we started our simulations. The first simulation we did is classical Monte Carlo. Basically, no quantum effects. And if we do that, we found a parelectric to ferroelectric transition at 30 Kelvin. So a peak in the dielectric response and polarization appears, which is not what experiments see. And now we put quantum effects into play, which is indicated by this uh, dots uh, symbol, and suddenly uh, polarization disappears, suddenly no peak in the dielectric response, and good agreement to experiment. So this shows that indeed, in this system, is the quantum effects that are killing polarization and making this dielectric response very big at low uh, temperature. We are able also to look at uh, uh, the distribution of the electric dipoles. If it's classical Monte Carlo, this picture is showing you that basically they are all along one, one, one directions at low temperature. If it's uh, quantum effects uh, uh, being uh, um, incorporated, you have a more disorder pictures of electric dipoles. But it's not completely a disorder. You can uh, compute, um, this is what uh, Eliereza did, the correlation of dipoles. And what the first one is telling you is uh, for classical, it's basically telling you that all the dipoles are on one, one, one. But for path integral quantum Monte Carlo is telling you that you have some kind of short range order between dipoles. If you have a dipole along x direction, if you go to its nearest neighbors along x, it also wants to be along x direction. Same thing for the second nearest neighbors along x, but the correlation is uh, uh, diminishing. So you have some kind of needle-like uh, correlations along a specific uh, direction, and this is indicated in the paper on the bottom left. And now this is, in fact, uh, the first time I look at effective Hamiltonian when I was a postdoc with uh, David Vanderbilt. And what we did is to develop an effective Hamiltonian for solid solutions. So what, how did we do it? We did it into two steps. We say, OK, there are B prime and B double prime ions, let's say titanium and zirconium in PZT. We are going to replace this titanium and zirconium by a virtual simple system. So we are going to generate something that does not exist, an average B, which for which for the potential is some kind of compositional average between B prime and B double prime. If you have simple uh, system, you can use the energy effective Hamiltonian provided uh, before for a, a simple system. And this is what we did. And then say, no, no, this is not good. I mean, you have titanium on zirconium ion for real. You don't have a mixture between these two guys. So you put a second term. This is the energy E2 that basically uh, characterize uh, the true alloy uh, represented by sigma. If sigma is plus one is, let's say, titanium. If sigma is minus one, it's zirconium. And so you have a perturbation of your virtual uh, system. And the nice thing about that is that all the parameters of E1 and E2, you can get them by first principle uh, calculations. You, you, you need to have a code but basically do VCA, it's, it's very easy. We also suggested how to do it with David Vanderbilt. And then uh, you put some perturbation there and you get the parameters of E2. So let me go about E2 because this was the novelty at that time. So you have 
two new energy. One that characterizes the on-site effect of alloying on the energy and is basically telling you that how zirconium or titanium ions are modifying the double well potential with respect to the virtual crystal alloy. The second kind of energy is anthracite effect. Imagine I have a zirconium on site J, how it's going to modify the local dipoles on site I close to it or the strain around it. So quite easy. Uh, and then these are the results. So this came directly out of the implementation, implementation of this uh, alloy effective Hamiltonian. This is local mode, which means polarization versus composition. You see on the left side for smaller composition, X, you have a rhombohedral state, polarization on one, one, one. On the right side for composition over 50% of titanium, you have tetragonal state with polarization on the other one. And in between, you have something new. You have a monogenic state for which the polarization is rotating between 1, 1, 1 and 0, 1. And it's exactly the state that Beatrice Noeda was seeing uh, one year before in, in 1999. And they say, OK, so this is good to find monogenic state. What about piezoelectricity? Because PZT is super important for piezoelectricity. So with the effective Hamiltonian, we can calculate the piezoelectric coefficient. We get D31, D33. D33, for instance, is you apply an electric field along Z and you look at the strain along Z. So if you look at D33, let's say at the room temperature, this effective Hamiltonian is telling you it's 55 picocoulomb per Newton. But experimentally, it's 170. So, so something was very strange. And in fact, we realized that uh, um, the piezoelectricity measure in PZT are on ceramic sample, not single crystal. If you are dealing with ceramics, a kind of average for piezoelectric response, you do have D33 of single crystal, D31 of single crystal, but you have a third one, which is D15. And this D15 was incredibly uh, big. If you put this D33, D31, D15 of single crystal into the formula indicated uh, above, you get the D33 of C and you get 163 coulomb per Newton, which is very, very close to experimental value. So the effective Hamiltonian are able to reproduce periodicity and also able to explain why you have such large response. In that case, you have huge DY5 uh, coefficient. And then we say, okay, what not uh, stopping here? Let's go to periodic coefficient versus composition, looking at this D33 and D15. And we find that in this monoclinic intermediate phase, huge response. We're talking about 4,000, 5,000 um, uh, picocoulomb uh, per newton. You can also put electric field into your simulation, as I told you before. For instance, we wanted to have an idea is if you start with a PCT with, let's say, um, in a rhomboheteral state, pressure on one one. You apply electric field, but you increase the magnitude, but along the other one. At the end, it's for sure you're going to have tetragonal phase because of minus p dot e turn. Pressure will be along the other one, but in between, you don't know how you go from R to T phase. And the system got crazy. It went through a lot of uh, different uh, phases. Two monoclinic phase that are known as MA and MC, but also a triclinic phase. And because of that, you can have very large uh, responses because polarization is basically rotating there. And now we understand that if polarization is uh, rotating, um, piezoelectricity is pretty big. So now let me go to something else. It's a development that we did. Uh, for, I don't know, probably now um, 17 years. It's effective Hamiltonian for free electric nano structure. There are two big changes with respect to bulks, and we say about boundary conditions. The first one is about electrical boundary condition. For instance, imagine you have a polarization that uh, points up automatically because of um, p dot n surface charges. The bottom surface will be charge minus. The top surface will charge plus. From plus to minus, you have a field that is created. This is the depolarizing field. And this guy is against the polarization. If you don't have a screening of this surface and use charges, you are going to have a big diverging field. If, and this is open circuit electrical boundary condition. If you have something that's screened like metallic electrodes, basically you don't have diverging field anymore. You have short circuit boundary conditions. So in nanostructure, you can go from open circuit to short circuit depending on your system. The second boundary condition that is super important 
as well we also talk about that uh, yesterday. Eh? It's mechanical boundary condition. If you grow your film on a substrate that has a larger that is constant, the film is going to expand laterally. This is tensile strain. If you do the same thing, but on a smaller substrate, the film is going to contract in the XY plane. We are dealing now with compressive strain. So these two boundary conditions are very important. So how we did that in a Ponomareva, uh, even now of and, and Sergei Presente find a, a very smart way uh, how to do that. Uh, it's a little bit technical, but uh, I, I refer to you uh, to the paper indicated here, a PRB of 2005. The idea is, 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 is quite uh, smart uh, in my mind, is that for any um, load dimensional structure, wires, dots, uh, um, super lattices, uh, um, so 0D, 1D, or 2D, let's say films, you calculate the dipole dipole interaction. For example, in 0D, you do that in real space. In 3D, you do that in a reciprocal space. But between 1D and 2D, it's kind of mixture between real space and reciprocal space. And you compute the maximum diversion field. Let's call that epsilon uh, dipole. Uh, and then you put a coefficient that we call beta. Beta equals zero, which means you have perfect open circuit boundary condition. Beta equal one, you have screened this guy, and you can do any beta between zero and one. So you can go continuously from open circuit-like conditions to uh, short circuit uh, electrical boundary condition. For mechanical boundary condition, once again, I will uh, talk about that. What you have to do, you look at the strain tensor, and uh, for instance, uh, you fix this eta one and eta two, uh, that are basically the, the strain in the XY plane, and you fix them such as to reproduce the lattice constant of a substrate. You also fix eta six. If it's a cubic substrate, A and B are going to be perpendicular to each other, which means that eta six will be zero. And that's how you do, uh, um, you mimic your strain there. And a lot of uh, things uh, uh, that we did over the years, but let me go over a, a recent uh, paper. It's a nature communication paper done uh, by Yusra uh, Nahas and uh, um, Sergei uh, Prokorenko and our collaborators in Australia from the group of uh, Professor uh, Valanur. And this is uh, um, temperature versus electric field phase diagram. And this temperature is the temperature at which you quench the system from a high temperature to this uh, special temperature. And this phase diagram is very interesting because it tells you, you can have a lot of different phases depending on your quench temperature, depending on the electric field that you put into the system. For example, you have phase one. Phase one are a labyrinth structure. Phase two are disconnected labyrinth structure. Phase three is a special bimeron skirmion phase. Phase four are the special electrical skirmions. And if you look at panel C1 and C2, this experimental data that confirm the existence of the different phases. So with effective Hamiltonian, you can reproduce uh, uh, this uh, nice, uh, very complex uh, topological uh, phases. And you can also understand how they are created. For, so uh, I refer to this paper, but technically it's a non-equilibrium physics and you have different origin of the phases. One is called spinodal decomposition. The other one is called uh, nucleation uh, regime. But I just want to show you that now with FPV Hamiltonian, in fact, since uh, 2003, uh, you can do a, a nanostructure with no big deal. Um, and you can also really study uh, topological effects. For example, uh, panel uh, A is about uh, a topological things, which is called the pondering charge density. So its value is telling you what kind of topological object you have. Is it a skirmion? Is it a merons? And also you can look inside your system and find very interesting uh, uh, object. So when you go from phase one to phase five, for instance, that I told you before, this topological appear or disappear with some kind of a puzzling uh, pieces that when you put them together, you have a skirmion of bimerons, for example. B is a concave disclination. Uh, C is called a concave disclination. And this guy can work together. For example, if I put two B together, uh, you get a D, uh, uh, which is like a saddle four-fold uh, junctions. Uh, if I put uh, B and C uh, together, you get this handle called Meron and Timeron. So a lot of different uh, um, topological defects. Uh, uh, and especially I want to draw your attention to panel H. This is known as the turrogate skirmions. It is non magnetic structure, but was not known in the electrical uh, structure uh, before uh, this uh, study. And all uh, this uh, 
and terracing uh, defects were confirmed experimentally as well, once again, by the group of uh, Professor uh, Valenour in uh, Sydney, uh, Australia. In, in particular, uh, Vivasha and Peggy were the one doing the experiment. And now let me go to something that people mentioned yesterday and asked a question uh, to uh, uh, Osvaldo. What happens if you have, let's say, over degrees of freedom? Let's say tilting. So tilting, you can have uh, out of phase, uh, anti phase tilting. We, I'm going to call that omega r, which is related to the r point. Um, and you can have in phase tilting. I'm going to call that uh, omega m. And this is related to the M point of the first Brian zone. And they are very nice notation introduced by Glazers in the 70s about tilting system, for example, A0, 0, C minus, telling you that there is no tilt about A and B axis, and there's a tilt about the C axis, and it's uh, anti phase because of the minus sign. So, a lot of very interesting things in theoretics about the uh, anti phase tilting. For example, um, a lot of different groups in the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, Beatrice Noheda, uh, Woodward, and Rene groups uh, show phases like the CC phase. And the CC phase is interesting for two reasons. It's monogamic, and it also tells you that in addition to polarization, there's a tilting. If there's no tilting, it will be CM phase. So we developed with uh, Igor Kornev uh, a numerical method in 2006 that you incorporate both electric and this uh, AFD degrees of freedom, anti distortive, tilting. What you do is quite simple. You basically add energy that are related to this AFD degrees of freedom, but do not forget to add the couplings with the strain and polarization. And we wanted to have an idea what's going on in PZT. And in particular, we look at the special compositional regions, uh, about 50%. And this is uh, what we found in these simulations. And what do we confirm? First, we confirm that there is indeed a CC phase. And what we found is for a small, narrow range of composition, extremely close to the experimental one. We also found other things. We found that there is this I4CM phase. It's a tetragonal phase, but in addition to polarization, it has a tilt about the z-axis. And later on, this was, if I when understood, confirmed experimentally. We also found that uh, technically, it's not vertical, the, the region of separation between rhombohedral and monoclinic. It's a little bit inclined. And you have very interesting points, but for which uh, we are called multi-phase points, for which different phases meet uh, each other in this temper temperature composition phase uh, diagram. So, so this is, was a summary of what uh, we did. Uh, now, why tilting is important? It's also important for anti ferritic system because there are couplings of the form, let's say u omega omega or u omega square omega. Omega is about tilting, as I told you before, but u now, it's about antipolar motion. For instance, if you look at PNA mass states, which in Glazer notation is A minus A minus C plus, it means it has an anti phase tilting about 110. That's why you have A minus A minus. And uh, in phase tilting about the C axis, that's why you have C plus. But there is a special coupling. It's called UX omega R omega M. And this brings UX into play, into formation, creation. And UX is antipolar. So it's basically if I look at one zero the one plane, all the cations move along one one zero. But if I go uh, the uh, zero one plane above it, now the cations are moving along minus one, minus one, zero uh, direction. So opposite, it's a nice antipolar motions. And with that, we, we look, for example, at PNMS states in bismuth uh, neodymium system. In this uh, paper done by uh, first author is uh, Bin Xu uh, there. And we were able to compute polarization versus electric field. So you go from a PNMS state to a electric state. And this PE loop is very important because then you can compute uh, energy storage, and you can compute uh, efficiency, which is important uh, for uh, anti electric application. And we find huge energy density above 100 uh, joule per centimeter cube and very large efficiency. So we say this anti electric, especially PNMFAs, take a look at them because they can be very uh, promising for uh, application. And these couplings are also responsible for a lot of different um, physics. For example, they are responsible for what is called hybrid hyperperfectricity. You put two PNMA systems together, 
uh, what do not have separately a polarization. When you put them together, they have a polarization. These are due to this coupling. And they're also responsible for variety of tilting patterns, not only uh, this sample A minus minus C plus, but let's say along the C axis, instead of having plus minus or plus plus, uh, you can have a combination between these two guys. This means uh, on a phonon spectra, uh, you can go from the R point to the M point in between these two guys. For example, in sodium now bed, there are seven phase transition sequences and we are able to reproduce uh, all of them there in this recent paper of uh, three years ago. And each of these guys are different tilting patterns. Some of them, for instance, you need 12 uh, lattice uh, constants along the C axis to reproduce uh, uh, the patterns there. And you can do that now these days with effective Hamiltonian. What about the uh, multiferics? Uh, that's the same idea. You incorporate energy that are now related to magnetic degrees of freedom, in addition to strain, polarizations, and tilting. But do not forget to add the coupling between magnetism and strain and polarization and tilting. And this is what we did um, in, in, in all these years. Uh, and we're still working on that. And there are also very, very interesting coupling. Um, it was mentioned uh, by the uh, previous uh, speaker, uh, the talk is, was really very good, um, is uh, this is known as the spin current uh, model. And what is interesting is that you have on the left side, P cross E, P is the polarization electrical one, EIJ is the direction, uh, one uh, unit vector on a special direction. For example, in, in, in uh, Bismuth variety, it will be along one minus one zero direction. And on the right side, you have a cross product between MI and MJ. So you have polarization via P cross E. You have uh, the MI interaction, magnetic one, because MI cross MJ. And these guys, this spin current model is absolutely responsible for the formation of a cycloid in Bismuth ferrite. But if you pay close attention to this uh, term, that's quite interesting because MI cross MJ is magnetic chirality. So imagine you have a right-handed uh, uh, magnetic uh, cycloid. And now if you apply thick field and change the operation from one, one, one to minus one, minus one, minus one, this term is telling you that if you want to minimize the energy as any, any system should do, you should change MI cross MJ. It should go from plus to minus. This means, physically speaking, if you change the direction of polarization by applying an electric field, you should change the magnetic chirality. So we try that in this uh, paper, probably in 2004, this PRL paper. And this is chirality, magnetic one versus time. And this on the bottom is AFM vector, antiferromagnetic one versus time. And what these, guy, these pictures are telling you is between 0 and 250 seconds, the magnetic uh, cycloid is unchanged. Between 200 and 400, it's destroyed in favor of uh, AFM, antiferromagnetic. Between 400 and 1,650 frames per second, suddenly you have an opposite chirality, but half of the initial one. And finally, above some time, the spin cycloid as the chirality vector that is exactly opposite to the initial one, which means what you have done is the ultra fast switching of magnetic chirality. You went from right handed magnetic cycloid to left handed magnetic cycloid by applying an electric field. It's a very nice magneto electric effect. And this can be done these days with effective Hamiltonian uh, simulations. So some conclusions here, uh, quite a broad uh, conclusions. Effective Hamiltonian methods have been developed now since 1994. And they have been very useful uh, to, to make prediction, to confirm experiment, but also to provide insights. And, and for the design of new material, I think they are quite uh, important. Simple ferritic system were first uh, investigated and uh, in biome titanet and uh, you can do even more complicated by putting quantum effects then historically uh, fair electric solid solutions have been investigated thanks to this guy then fair electric nanostructures and then historically speaking complexity improved by putting uh, these uh, tiltings and the couplings but also looking at uh, anti electrics and, and multiferics this can be done uh, these days and um, uh, other things, uh, I mean, I didn't talk about all the physical things you can get. I mean, we're using that for 
electrocaloric uh, responses, um, a lot of, of a magnetoelectric uh, response. Uh, uh, things that I have not uh, been talking uh, about is about uh, dynamical properties uh, too much. I, I just show you the uh, ultra-fast switching of uh, uh, magnetic chirality in BFO, but uh, you, you can do so much more. But for that, you have to use molecular dynamics rather than Monte Carlo. And for instance, in these uh, two papers of uh, 2008, what we prove using effective Hamiltonian and molecular dynamics and in collaboration with a group of Yeka Linka in Czech Republic is that uh, there are two modes that are very important in biomechanics, the soft mode, as uh, it is usual, but there is another mode, which is called the central mode. And this is basically characteristic of polarization jumping from plus to minus as a function of time. And, and to understand biomechanics, it is important to have these two modes. There was a controversy between these two papers. Is, is there a soft mode only or a central mode? And, and, and these papers, I think, uh, put an end to this controversy. You, you should deal with two modes. You can do also very nice physics, like nonlinear effect like Fermi resonance. So this was done by uh, Dai Wei Wang, um, for example, in this paper. And uh, in 2016, also with Dawei as first author, we look the first time at relaxers and the dielectric relaxation, very strange system. Uh, basically the dielectric response depends tremendously on uh, the frequency of your applied electric field, unlike in ferroelectrics and this effective Hamiltonian where uh, a ball to uh, reproduce these effects uh, that are also important in, in, in terahertz or sub-terahertz uh, regime. And a very uh, active uh, field that we are pursuing right now is uh, ultra-fast uh, neuromorphic computing. Uh, you can do that with uh, effective Hamiltonian and molecular dynamics. And this PRL paper, for which the first author is a Sergei uh, Prosendev, uh, this is about uh, PMN. And what we found is that if we apply train of electric pulses in this system, you basically mimic all the key features of a neuromorphic computing, uh, the activation, uh, the uh, non-volatile um, uh, memory states, uh, etc. And you do that at the terahertz uh, regime, this means uh, ultra fast. So I also think uh, that these effective Hamiltonian approaches can be very, very useful uh, uh, to, 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 to provide design of a lot of system, including very complex one, like for ultra fast uh, neuromorphic computing, but uh, we are pursuing uh, quite a lot. Uh, 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 with that, uh, I'm done uh, with the talk. I really would like to thank 